Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. Coming up, Palestinian factions including Fatah and Hamas have reached a reconciliation agreement in Beijing. How important is this breakthrough? U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has won enough support from her party to clinch the Democratic nomination. But has she got what it takes to beat Donald Trump? G20 finance ministers meet in Brazil this week to seek consensus on economic policy. What's on top of their agenda? China will take a multi-pronged approach to improve the new system for mobilizing resources and boosting overall performance of the country's innovation system. China's newly adopted resolution on further deepening reform comprehensively to advance Chinese modernization includes measures covering almost every aspect of technological innovation, including mechanism reform, talent development, and policy boosts. Observers say the top-level design will play a vital role in mobilizing resources and coordinating efforts to spearhead China's technological progress in the years to come. For more on this, my colleague Zhao Yang spoke with Yao Shujie, Chang Kung Professor of Economics at Chongqing University. So, Professor Yao, according to the resolution, China will deepen scientific and technological structural reform. So why is that important right now? Yeah, uh, President Xi Jinping pointed out the new productive forces have to rely on technological and, uh, and innovation, technological progress and innovation. Uh, because technological uh, progress is the key element or the, the most important driving element for improving the productive uh, a, a, you know, capacity of the country to improve the quality of, of industry and output and so on. So um, focus on science and technological innovation is the, is the most important policy action that we need to, uh, you know, to enhance the country's new productive forces. And um, China is moving into a stage of high quality economy development, mm. which have to be driven really by this kinds of technological progress because the population structure and also the industrial structure require some major transformation uh, 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 to upgrade China's economy uh, performance toward the frontier of the world. And to do so, I mean, we cannot rely on traditional technology, traditional uh, production mode. We need to use new technology to drive the production process. Mm. So what specifically needs to be done on that front? The series of measures cover almost every aspect of technological innovation, like mechanism reform, talent development, and policy boosts. So could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, in order to increase the capacity of technological innovation, uh, a number of actions need to be, to be taken. First of all, uh, government at all level have to invest more into R&D and also uh, application of existing technology. And secondly, uh, the, the management system have to be improved so that limited amount of money invested in R&D can produce the maximum technological output. And also the minimum amount of resources applied to the industry got to produce the maximum adoption level of technology so that the whole system could be uh, uh, fundamentally transformed. Mm. And another thing is talents, you know, people, you know, up to all, all the technology uh, innovation and the technological diffusion and adoption critically depends on human resources. So talent and also the workers at the factory level, they all need to be improved in terms of the quality. Mm. So when we discuss science and tech innovation, Professor Yao, there are many different players involved, including universities, research institutes, enterprises, and more. And the resolution emphasized the reinforcing the principal role of enterprises in innovation. So why is that? Yes, I mean, if we look at the, how innovation is, is conduct, conducted and also technological uh, you know, innovation are made, Basically, in, in China and also in the rest of the world, we have an, a number of players in, in, in the system. 
Uh, the firstly is the research institutes, and in the Chinese case, it is Chinese Academy of Science, and also the, all the branches of the Chinese Academy of Sciences across the country. Next, this at the national level. At the regional level, every province have their own research institutes and academies. Mm. But more importantly, China have over you know three thousand university. And at least a few hundred of them are, are highly research oriented. These are the very important players for fundamental research. The, the so called zero to one breakthroughs, most of them coming from the, the university and also the Chinese Academy, Academy of Sciences. Another force of technological innovation is actually the medium size and the large size enterprises particularly the state-owned enterprises and the large uh, private enterprises. Now, these enterprises, they are, first of all, they are large and they are highly profitable. So they are able to invest in technological uh, you know, innovation that address the need of the, the reality of industries. Now, we have another issue, you know, how to combine uh, the, the fundamental researchers, for example, like the Chinese Academy of Science and their branches, as well as the, the research all in Antic University, how their research output can be directly applied to the enterprises. So the combination and the integration of research and application to the industry critically depends on the enterprises capability to absorb those technology and apply to the in industrial uh, production process. So this is this why and we emphasize on the enterprises, because after all, it's the enterprises which are going to create the product, not the university, not the research institutes. However, the enterprises cannot work by themselves because the large breakthrough are through the university and the research uh, institutes. So this is why uh, we emphasize enterprises, but we also emphasize the integrated effort of the research institutes, university and enterprises. Mm. And as you mentioned earlier, Professor Yao, talent is also key for innovation. So does China have enough talents in frontier fields like 5G, like AI? And what could be done to attract and nurture more talents in terms of not only the national policy, but also the industrial policies, educational system, and so forth? Yes, you can see China has already have educated about 252 million. Uh, university graduated from, since, the, since the economy reform started in 1978. You know, in, in 1982, we have only 4 million people. And nowadays, we have 252 uh, million people. So the, the talents, the, the, you know, the, the human resources have been critically increased. Now, we, we also have uh, some other challenges, for example, like how the university education could be uh, adapted to uh, to resolve the real uh, you know uh, production and technological problem in the enterprises so the question is not the lack of talents the question is how the talents can be used most effectively and how the talent can be uh, used to focus on the on the technological frontier where china can compete uh, you know fairly effectively with the rest of the world so in that case, what can be done for better treatment of young scientists so that they can focus on research? I think the government have to create an environment that the young scientists, they can work without too much pressure, but they can also have the a, you know, capability to research on their, own, and on their own idea. So regulations at the central and local level, and also the institutional level, they have to be considerate in terms of, first of all, they should give the, the, the stimulus uh, for the young talents to perform, but they also have to create a very conducive, competitive environment, particularly the living, the education, a healthcare system. They have to be improved and they are friendly uh, to uh, you know, the young talents, actually to all the talents, uh, particularly the young talent who are facing more pressure in terms of the, the living conditions and the working environment. Mm. 
So uh, it, it, you know, government in Tichun, they have to pay significant attention of how to reduce the pressure, how to improve an environment that they can compete uh, more effectively. Mm. And we are living in this time of rapid changes with artificial intelligence. So how should the education be adapted to these new changes brought about by AI? Well, I think the most university, uh, particularly the university I have been working on, and they are trying very hard to change the curriculum. And some universities already have created a new program which are particularly focusing on the AI and the digital economy. But to me, that may not be enough. I mean, uh, much more work have to be done, especially, especially the, the curriculum have to change uh, to, the, to the new technological environment, particularly to address the real need of the enterprises that we just mentioned. Mm. And regarding the new quality productive forces, the resolution encouraged uh, fostering this type of innovation in line with local conditions. So how do you explain that? And how important is this strategy for China's long-term development? Yeah, every, every production activity and also research and innovation activity is to resolve the real problem at the local level. So different localities, different provinces, or even prefectures, they have different uh, economy and, 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 and social condition, particularly the endowment of, um, of human capital, technology and, and capital. And because they are different, the production system may be different. Uh, so the research and innovation have to be uh, you know, effectively fitted with the local condition to produce the maximum output with given amount of input. And so in the broader picture, Professor Yao, how do you assess China's science and technology innovation capabilities right now? Well, China has made a, a huge and re remarkable progress in terms of technological progress. Uh, uh, you know, in many areas, China is actually becoming the front runners of technology. For example, like the 5G, the Internet of Things, the mobile payment, and also the modern transportation, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, automation, robustic, uh, you know, production, and so on. Uh, but the, in terms of computer chips, China is making a, a huge progress, but still a little bit lacking behind the most advanced countries, such as the United States and also the Netherlands. So uh, this become the bottleneck of the Chinese uh, technological progress. And China have to do much more to break through in this area so that uh, it, it can come to a level playing field uh, with, the, with the most advanced economy in the world. That is Yao Shujie, Chen Kung Professor of Economics at Chongqing University, speaking with Zhao Yang. You're listening to World Today. Stay with us. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Representatives of Palestinian factions have met in Beijing to promote reconciliation. These groups, including Hamas and Fatah, signed the Beijing Declaration that aims to bridge divisions and strengthen unity. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi also attended the meeting. This is the second round of meetings between Hamas and Fatah in Beijing. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has said the country supports all Palestinian factions in achieving reconciliation through dialogue and consultation. Dong Xue has more. In a show of rare unity, 14 Palestinian groups, including Hamas and Fatah, had agreed and signed the Beijing Declaration and all, all agreed to a list of commitments at a reconciliation meeting hosted by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. This is yet another move itself, says the historic significance to achieve a comprehensive national unity between Hamas and Fatah, where well, both of them have also expressed their gratitude towards China for providing such a opportunity for reconciliation talks in Beijing. And China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi said that there is no single interest on the Palestinian issues by Beijing. And all Beijing wants is to deliver and is to provide a fair and just proposal to uh, the Palestine. And earlier in April, there has been a round of talks held in, you know, aiming for reconciliation. Beijing has also repeatedly said that on the Palestinian issue, China's position is um, consistent 
and clear. And it says, uh, it, when he said, and I quote, we stand on the side of peace and justice and the common aspiration of the majority of the countries and the coexistence of uh, mankind. We hope that the uh, international community guided by the adversary of, um, opinion of the court will make unwavering efforts to promote an early settlement of the uh, Palestinian issues and achieve lasting peace and stability in the Middle East region. And before the April talks, the groups has also met in you know, Moscow in February. And similar rounds of talks were held in the uh, past years in Turkey, Algeria and Egypt. That is Don Xie reporting. And for more on the significance of this meeting, we are joined by In Zhiguang, Professor of International Relations with Fudan University. Professor In, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, tell us more about this agreement between Palestinian factions. What has been agreed upon and how significant is it? Uh, I mean, this is absolutely astonishing and very, very encouraging improvement in Middle Eastern peace process. Uh, the uh, it's not entirely clear what has been agreed upon. Uh, we only just have the information from the speech that uh, uh, um, 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 Wang Yi um, um, gave, and based on his speech, we know that uh, the all sides, all sectors in Palestine agreed on to push towards a peaceful um, uh, res- resolution of the Palestinian issue and to continue the ceasefire, to make sure that humanitarian aid would be able to get into Palestine. And secondly, they all, uh, all sides will agree that they, it should be a self-determination, the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian people rule the Palestine. And also, thirdly, and I think finally, we know that uh, China is fully support uh, a unified Palestine to join as a full-fledged member in the United Nations, which consequently will be a very significant move to push towards a peaceful resolution uh, in the future. Yeah. Uh, What do you think are the key factors that motivated the Palestinian sides to set aside their differences and reach this agreement? Um, Well, there's a great question. Uh, I think, to my understanding, uh, there are at least um, we could consider three factors uh, influencing this particular wonderful achievement. One, of course, internally, the Palestinian people have been suffering for way too long, and it is absolutely vital for a peaceful resolution, a ceasefire. So there is internal will from all sides to stop the atrocity and continue on. Uh, a peaceful resolution. That's the, inter- uh, that's the internal will. Political will is there, and China recognised that political will. And so, henceforth, secondly, China steps in as a member of the Global South country with no specific interest affiliated to either side, but standing on a neutral point, um, uh, standing on a position for peace, um, and facilitating this peaceful negotiation, China definitely play a vital role as a neutral third party, providing a, um, a platform uh, of exchange for all sides, a safe platform, a, a, a non-partial uh, um, uh, platform, which is crucial and that has never been seen uh, in the previous peaceful, uh, peace negotiations. And thirdly, I think the international, the global context, the global political context has moved um, uh, towards a, um, a situation that is in favor of this uh, huge reconciliation. On one hand, the international um, society had witnessed way too much uh, the atrocity committed by Israeli side and there is a general will of, uh, within the international community to call for a ceasefire to see some improvement uh, for the situation. And also uh, on the international level, we see there is a um, political um, transition or there is a trend uh, of, of political transition in the United States. Um, the uncertainty starts to emerge 
uh, the Biden administration does not necessarily have the absolute uh, winning hand and that there is a possibility for Trump um, to step back into the White House. So all sides need to consider uh, what could be done in the future. They have to uh, they have to be prepared for what's coming. Yeah, and on your second point regarding China's role in facilitating this agreement, can you discuss more on that, especially if you compare that with uh, previous international mediation efforts? Uh, well, I mean, the Palestinian issue has been in human um, society, international society, for way too long, for almost over two centuries. And in the past two centuries, we have all been witnessing uh, or reading about um, the uh, the global hegemon trying to reconciliate, trying to um, break, uh, trying to break uh, to uh, to break a peaceful negotiation. All those hegemons, they have they're not impartial, right? Uh, starting from the beginning, um, the the mandate from the British, uh, the United Kingdom, which um, it is a colonial um, uh, power and had a significant in, uh, interest in the Palestinian area, and they arguably pushed forward the Zionist movement in the late 19th century. So they're not impartial. And then moving towards the end of the Second World War, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, as we know it today, start to emerge with the establishment of Israeli uh, of Israel as a as a as a as a as a state. And behind that it was the American trying to push forward the peaceful new, uh, process, a uh, negotiation process. America was not impartial either. It was um, uh, recognized by uh, the uh, widely by the Middle Eastern population as the uh, as the hands behind the Israeli and Zionist movement in since the mid 20th century, um, and there is a sort of an inclination, a suspicion, an inherited suspicion towards the old colonial masters uh, about their sincerity towards uh, the uh, the uh, peaceful negotiations. So, henceforth, they're not impartial either. Uh, the European side wants to do something, but they can't do it because of the colonial uh, but historical burden. But for the first time in history, a truly impartial uh, um, um, uh, agent, China, uh, as a uh, emergent, as a member of the global South, as a um, uh, a global power with very clear track record, with no history of colonialism, start to get involved in this, uh, has the ability to get involved in this peaceful process and uh, were able to deliver um, um, at this time of the uh, of history. And I think it is absolutely encouraging and wonderful. Okay, and very briefly, what could this mean to the war in Gaza, especially if we consider Israel's opposition to Hamas? The reconciliation among all the 14 fractions in Palestine provides the opportunity for the Palestinian people to start to build their nation, their national capacity as one unit, uh, instead of as confronting fragments. And uh, we know the colonial mentality is divide and conquer. If they can't divide a group of people, the Palestinians uh, in, per se, um, um, uh, they can't really uh, deliver their country that easy, uh, that easily. So it will be a promising start for nation building uh, to build a true, truly independent Palestine with no foreign intervention um, um, uh, in the future. That's- yes. Thank you, Professor Ng Guan of International Relations with Fudan University. You're listening to World Today. We'll be back after a short break. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. 
A majority of U.S. Democratic delegates have pledged to support Vice President Kamala Harris as the party's next presidential nominee. It signals that she is likely to secure the nomination next month. Harris has also won the backing of Nancy Pelosi to lead the party against Donald Trump in the November election. 59-year-old Harris made her first public appearance on Monday since President Joe Biden announced he would drop out of the race. She vowed to do everything in her power to defeat Donald Trump. For more, we are joined by He Wenping, senior research fellow at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Kamala Harris has reportedly received the endorsement of enough delegates to win the nomination. But does this mean she has already secured her position as the Democratic nominee, or are there still uncertainties regarding these early endorsements? Ah,、uh, well, yes. Ah,、uh, Harris seems already ah、uh, got、uh, quite a lot of、uh, endorsement from、uh, those Democrats, famous even including former President like、uh, Clinton and、uh, Hillary Clinton. Both of them,、uh, and also、uh, recently I heard Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of、uh, U.S. Congress,、uh, also gave her、uh, this endorsement to Harris. I also collect information, seeing as many as 22 states in the U.S. You know, those uh, uh, Democrats already saying、uh, now give their、uh, endorsement to Harris. So since now、uh, this is a majority、uh, of those.、Uh, Uh, endorsements she has already collected, but we cannot say now everything has been settled down,、uh, because like uh, former President uh, uh, Obama, including others, they still insisted on、uh, come out with the you know the final candidate、uh, from next month. This、uh, Democrat Party, the National Congress, next month. So I think still has some、uh, debating going on. So they are still in the final rounds of debating. Maybe they will give this time、uh, for Harris to see、uh, how she can perform. I think、uh, this is the final, at least final ten meters. If we call this is a one hundred meters race,、okay. now still have a final ten meter、uh, race. Well, Harris's campaign said it had raised 81 million U.S. dollars in its first 24 hours. That's more than Biden did in the first two months of his own campaign. So, what does this indicate about her support base? Yeah, this of course is very encouraging,、uh, which shows now at least those uh, uh, you know potential financial supporter and then also those voters even、uh, donated very small money, but、uh, the people are quite a lot. If in terms of number, which means now finally they see、uh, the Democrats at least now they have come out with their candidate because the Joe Biden after this very first uh, this uh, TV debate with Donald Trump and then、uh, honestly speaking、uh, his performance、uh, the Biden、uh, wasn't that good uh, so uh, eventually you know immediately after that first the TV debate and then there was a call. Uh, even within the Democrat Party themselves, saying now the Biden、uh, is not that suitable、uh, for continue、uh, this kind of、uh, like second round debate or third round. So and then plus uh, this uh, uh, shooting、uh, this to Donald Trump,、uh, this、uh, you know assassination now eventually make Donald Trump those Republicans now got、uh, you see the rocket high、uh, those supporting rates. So this give another pressure for the Democrats. They have to quickly, as soon as possible, at least to come out、uh, with a new candidate. So this decision, I think, this fund raise、uh, this money come to Harris campaign actually is not saying 100 percent for supporting Harris. This money comes to support Democrats. Actually, is a kind of a yes、uh, opinion to Biden step down. Okay, and, and what is your takeaway from Harris's first speech since Biden stepped down, and and what does it reveal about her campaign strategy? Well, this first speech remain carry on. I think the past uh, those uh, campaign strategy has been made by、uh, this Democrat. That is a lot of、uh, personal targeting towards Donald Trump. Actually, I don't think this is a very smart strategy because Donald Trump already building on. His image and his personality with that famous picture, that is,、uh, with the bleeding ear and even those blood comes to his face, and she, he remains holding high his face. Even the background is American national flag. So that photo already、uh, set a very strong、uh, this image for Donald Trump. 
Uh, he's a fighter. So now if you continue uh, targeting Donald Trump, okay, I think it seems like a bullet you're shooting out, and then eventually come back to yourself. So better, you just make clear what kind of thing you can do better than Donald Trump. For example, I have seen uh, one of the, those charter saying during the Biden's uh, four years administration, actually the job creation all has increased a lot compared even with all those previous presidency. So things you have done, you have been doing very good, so you just carry on. So for Harris, because she served as the deputy president uh, in the Biden's uh, there's a four years administration. So if uh, Biden's administration has been doing good job, of course, uh, this Harris also got this reputation. So I think that should be uh, the right way. Yes, but how much do we know about Harris's own stance on some of the key issues such as the economy, immigration, or foreign policy? And to what extent do her position differ from those of Joe Biden? Oh, I don't see any difference. Uh, you know, there's a policy uh, you know, point between her and uh, Joe Biden. Uh, they are working as a team. Uh, she just served as the deputy uh, you know, president. Uh, so actually... Uh, no matter economy or immigration and the foreign policy, so the, the, she is just like uh, uh, traveling, like uh, when, when her traveling to South Asian country, like to Philippines, uh, here and there. Also, the same point, uh, like uh, uh, all this, uh, just uh, like Blinken, Secretary of State, and also uh, Biden himself. So we haven't seen any differences. Uh, but now, uh, if she's trying to, you know, becoming the president, uh, now is of course to do domestic uh, those campaign. Uh, uh, I think she also need to uh, to ink something uh, with her own, uh, rather than everything is Biden's Biden. Because now, if she is going to lead the country forward, uh, she also needs to come out with something new. Uh, I, I don't think his uh, her team has worked out all those things yet. Okay. Uh, do you think the Republicans also need to adjust their campaign strategy now that they have to face a new opponent? For Republicans, now they think they made a first uh, victory already uh, because Biden now cannot cannot continue. So now they're celebrating the first one. But for the Harris, of course, they need to have uh, seriously come out with some strategy because uh, there's uh, Harris. Uh, she, you know, can representing like uh, minority ethnic group people. Uh, she has, you know, Indian origin, uh, American, and also it's a lady. Uh, American hasn't have a first, uh, you know, female president yet. So even this, uh, you know, point uh, maybe can attract a lot of uh, those uh, female, uh, those voters. And then uh, her Indian, uh, this American, this uh, this point also can attract uh, those minority. Uh, those ethnic groups like Asian American, Indian American, um, Jamaica. Those are uh, you know her father is from Jamaica. So all those uh, those uh, voters, yeah, maybe by nature, uh, will come you know rallied behind her. So that's why I think uh, even towards this, uh, this Donald Trump and also his partner, they need to work out a new strategy, how to newer uh, those uh, female voter, and then how to newer. Uh, those, uh, you know, minority, uh, those ethnic group, and also, like if uh, this, uh, uh, we don't know, huh, if Harris uh, makes sure her uh, position and then come out with another partner, some people say, oh, maybe get a very young face, and then if they come out with very good economic development policy, uh, all those, even plus foreign policy, now even, uh, you see, during this critical time, uh, even Israel Prime Minister Netanyahu also, you see, now visiting U.S. Uh, and then uh, even Ukraine Foreign Minister now visiting China. And then so all those issues. So also needs those uh, Donald Trump uh, group or the Harris, uh, the Democrat group, also should make very clear uh, their all the policies, uh, internationally, foreign policy, and ec- uh, economically, domestic policy, how to make jobs. Uh, not just saying, uh, if I'm on the, in the office, I will make this trade war with China, uh, bring job back to the U.S. This is an old tone already has been mentioned uh, even 80 years ago. So they need to come out with uh, something new uh, and also something uh, very now fit with American voters, uh, their desire. 
That's He Wenping, Senior Research Fellow at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. You're listening to World Today. We'll be back. China has called on the five nuclear weapon states to negotiate a treaty on no first use of nuclear weapons against each other or make a political statement in this regard. The proposal is part of the working papers submitted by China as representatives of the countries belonging to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT, gathered this week in Geneva to continue setting the table for the treaty's 2026 re- review conference. The U.S., Russia, China, France, and the U.K. are the five countries officially recognized as possessing nuclear weapons by the NPT. China is currently the only power among the five that formally maintains a no-first-use policy. And joining us now in the studio is my colleague Ding Heng. Thanks for being with us. Hey, Zhao Ying. So, why do you think from China's perspective there should be an initiative on no-first-use of nuclear weapons? Well, a nuclear war has no ultimate victor, but it will bring tremendous calamity to everyone involved. Uh, President Xi Jinping has on several different occasions reaffirmed China's position that nuclear war can't can't be fought. And this is a position that other nuclear weapon states would agree with in general if we take a look at, for example, a joint statement released by the leaders of the five nuclear weapon states in January 2022. But realistically, if a country retains the option of using uh, nuclear weapons first, it will create a dangerous situation in the sense that when this country decides to cross the line and use nuclear weapons first against a nuclear-armed adversary, those countries would almost certainly retaliate with their own nuclear weapons. And in addition, if a nuclear-armed country is concerned that an adversary might use nuclear weapons first in a particular you know, crisis, then that would increase this country's incentive to go nuclear first. So there is basically a use it or lose it thinking here. And the scenarios I have uh, mentioned here are by no means hypothetical only. For example, a long-standing American policy is a so-called negative security assurance. There is a U.S. promise in terms of not using nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states that are party to the NPT. Uh, China and Russia do not fall under this under this American negative security assurance because both uh, Russia and China are nuclear weapon states under the NPT, meaning that uh, China and Russia can be targets for nuclear uh, weapons uh, from the United States, including U.S. attacking China and Russia first. Therefore, a viable solution to reduce the pressure here is to take those nuclear weapons off the table except as a retaliatory measure. Well, China's no first use policy dates back to 1946, uh, I mean 1964, when China successfully detonated its atomic bomb. Mm. And immediately following that development, China made a declaration pledging not to be the first to use nuclear weapons at any time and under any circumstances. So what do you make of China's track record with regard to whether China has been adhering to this policy? Well, China has a very good track record in this regard. Beijing has repeatedly reaffirmed this position over the years. And since 1994, Beijing has been calling on or encouraging other uh, nuclear weapon states to commit to this uh, no first use policy. I mean, even when we talk about why China decided to develop nuclear weapons back in the 1950s and the 60s, It was not really aimed at that Beijing was aiming at threatening others, but rather for self-defense, its national sovereignty, and responding to the nuclear blackmail at the time. Um, 
Now, some people might criticize China's no first to use policy as merely decorative, and they say this policy could have changed sometime in the future. But one thing I would I would like to note here is that China actually stores its nuclear warheads separately from its missiles. This is pretty much different from the U.S. practice or the Russian practice. Um, so, if you want to launch a nuclear attack. In China's case, it would take some time to mate the warheads to the missiles. Therefore,、um, there will be no such thing as a surprise nuclear attack launched by China. So,、uh, basically, I think China has been fielding its nuclear forces in a way that is、uh, very much consistent with a no first use policy. And by the way, India also has a no first use policy. For that matter, but still, there are differences between China and India's cases in this regard. China's policy is basically、um, unconditional. By comparison, India's policy is conditional, in the sense that New Delhi reserves the right to use nuclear weapons if Indian forces are attacked with biological or chemical weapons. Well, we know that China has recently suspended negotiations with the U.S. on nuclear weapons limitations because of the continued U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. I mean, how how do you look at this move? Well, I think to me this was a move based on a legitimate concern on the part of the Chinese government. I mean, the continued sales of weapons to Taiwan from the United States. Is really undermining China's core interests. I mean, the Taiwan question is basically the core among the core concerns on the part of China, right? So, arming Taiwan continuously is of course detrimental to the mutual trust between Beijing and Washington. In China's understanding of the relationship between the U.S. and China. Um, advancement of many things, many agendas between the two sides, should really be based on a good,、uh, you know, general political atmosphere between the two sides, and certainly、uh, those issues would include this nuclear arms control negotiations.、Um, I think engagement on arms control will be difficult. When there are other challenges in the bilateral relationship, especially over the Taiwan question, so instead of blaming China for suspending the talks, I guess the Washington side probably really needs to have a self-reflection and really needs to, you know, think about how to restore the trust with Beijing. Well, then why do you think some Western analysts or polit-、uh, politicians are fabricating such a narrative about the so-called nuclear threat from China? Yeah, I have noticed this phenomenon as well. For example, in a media interview last month, the outgoing NATO、uh, chief Jens Stoltenberg claimed that there that、uh, quote a world where countries like China. Have nuclear weapons and NATO does not have is a more dangerous world. Unquote.、Um, I mean, this is probably part of a a broader China threat theory by those people.、Um, I mean, we just need to put out a simple fact.、Um, think about this: the nuclear warheads boasted by the United States is actually ten times that of China's warheads, and you call China as a nuclear threat. I mean, we need to be more logical in in terms of our thinking and in terms of the way we make arguments.、Uh, regarding Jens Stoltenberg's comments, his hostility towards China is really no secret, and maybe he is,、um, you know, thinking about making NATO this military alliance go beyond、uh, being a conventional combat force and becoming a nuclear alliance, maybe. That could be very dangerous thinking. Again, we need to try our best. I mean, everybody, every country needs to try its best to achieve sustainable security for all, rather than security for some at the expense of other people's security, other countries' security.、Uh, this is not only China's viewpoint, but also the views shared by the vast countries. Outside the NATO bloc. Okay, thank you, Ding Heng. You're listening to World Today. Stay with us.
You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. Finance ministers and central bankers from the Group of 20 meet this week in Brazil to seek consensus on economic policy. Brazilian diplomats said negotiators have agreed to leave discussion of the wars in Ukraine and Gaza out of the joint statement. While avoiding deadlock, Brazil hopes the approach may also shift the focus to economic cooperation on issues such as climate change and poverty. Brazil is also looking to increase support for proposed global tax on the superrich, a priority of its G20 presidency. For more, we are joined by Dr. Zhou Mi, a senior research fellow with the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. Dr. Zhou, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, what do you think are the key focus of the G20 finance ministers' meeting this week? Yeah, I think that it is important for them to try to understand about the situation nowadays, and also trying to discuss some of these consensus about how can we make the structural efforts to deal with the uncertainty and also the unequal development in the world. So we know that fiscal policies are really important for many of the economies to deal with the situation by the government efforts. If the government can agree, I mean the G20 members, they are the big apples in the basket of the world. They can do more to cooperatively to deal with the situation and trying to reduce the structural imbalance. It will be nice for the world. Well, we know Brazil has been a strong advocate for a global wealth tax on billionaires. Can you elaborate more on this proposal and its intention? Yes, the G20, you know, they have、uh, appointed one economist to write a report to discuss about how could it be possible for more tax from the billionaire. And from the findings of the report, they find that when the times goes on and the you know the percentage of the The wealth of the the most、uh, rich person in the world, they paid less tax compared with in the past. So, if you are talking about the the, the fairness, we should talk about the income or the wealth of the persons and what they have to, have to pay for the world. So, I mean, that is a suggestion from the report that maybe we can have more tax coming from these wealthy people, and they should be、uh, responsible to pay for a lot of cost that we have to deal with the uncertainty of the world. Yes, but with、uh, especially with the U.S. election looming, how realistic is it for the G20 to reach a consensus on a global wealth tax、uh, this year? Yeah, it's、uh, you know a real、uh, important question when talk about the possibilities. I would argue that it may be our very good dream about how can we deal with the inequality by more taxes. Well, in the past, the taxes is always an important measure for us to deal with uncertainty. But when we are talking about the possibility, it's another story. Because the United States,、uh, maybe it's, it's one of the country have the most, I mean, for the numbers, most、um, billionaires in the world. So if they can do more to deal with the situation, other countries can follow the suit. But as the elections are in a very different、uh, path compared with several months ago. So I would argue that it's not that easy for the government to do more things about the taxes, because even for the United States, they have、uh, they have to are、uh, you know to rely on the Congress to make the decisions on the taxes issues. If the taxes cannot be changed for the regulations, how could the billionaires to pay their taxes? And the following the next president, well, why why do they still want to follow these suits? Is still in the dark. I, I mean. So beyond the wealth tax, what are the avenues other to increase funding for、uh, you know poverty reduction as as well as climate action? Yeah, well, it is important for us to know that money is important, but money is not everything. Maybe we should try to to do more. I mean,、uh, collectively to get more money to support the actions on the climate change. But we will not only wait there. Actually, many of the business, I mean, for the enterprises, they have done a lot of re. Innovation based on the practices, so they have uh, in, uh, invented uh, many of these products, and they want to put it in the commercial uses. Like some of the car makers, I mean, the new energy vehicles makers in China, they have put a lot of efforts to reduce the cost for the people to use this kind of new product. And it is also beneficial for more, most of these countries to use the solar panels and the wind turbines to reduce the dependence on the fossil fuels. So I would say that we should try to do more innovation. Well, to do that, we have to provide better mechanism and the environment to protect the benefits of the innovation and I mean the the companies. 
So it, it's, it's also our kind of issues we can discuss under the G20 mechanism. Yes, and also um, it is reported that the G20 finance ministers, they're choosing to avoid the discussion of the wars in Ukraine and Gaza to focus more on the economy. But do you think this decision to sideline these geopolitical conflicts could impact the effect- uh, effectiveness of their economic policy discussion? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, really important for us to discuss about the reality because the world is under pressure. The pressure is not only because of the geopolitical issues or tensions. Well, the war is there and many of the stakeholders are trying to find out the better solutions to deal with the situation. Well, we have already seen some of the political or diplomatic efforts being paid by the related stakeholders. And I, I hope that they can deal with this uh, not only by the economic level, but also by more of the political levels. Well, when we're talking about the economy, I mean, the world is under pressure and we're still having uh, so many possibilities to, to develop for the different paths. If many of these uh, states can do more to cooperate, uh, to obey the rules and try to create a better room for the development, I believe that the economy can have a better and a resilient recovery. If they are not able to read consensus, I, I mean, that is a really dangerous for the world to lead some of uncertainties. Well, the technology development is also speeding up, and that is also one of the very important driving forces when we discuss about the possibilities of the economy recovery. So we may try to balance the different issues and try to pay more attention and focus on the most important and the vital factors that will affect the world economy, and that is what the G20 members, especially the decision makers, should do. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zhou Mi, a senior research fellow with the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. And that's all the time we have for this edition of World Today. A quick recap of today's headlines. Palestinian factions, including Fatah and Hamas, have reached a reconciliation agreement in Beijing. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has won enough support from her party to clinch the Democratic nomination. China has called on the five nuclear weapon states to negotiate a treaty on no first use of nuclear weapons against each other. And G20 finance ministers meet in Brazil this week to seek consensus on economic policy. To listen to this episode again or catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time. Thank you.